Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Ben, and this episode is about Star Trek, which is something Alan knows nothing about. He mixes up the Kelvin timeline with the original series, and he thinks a treble is some kind of bath sponge. So I'm here to save the day. And in this episode, we are going to talk about 10 design flaws of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D. So let's go. Number one, the bridge was an easy target. This is one of the most criticized aspects of the design of Federation starships. The bridge is situated right in the middle of the top of the saucer section, literally in the same place as a bullseye on a target. Put simply, there couldn't be an easier or more enticing target to hit. Now, the Enterprise D did have a battle bridge which could serve as a secondary bridge or the main bridge on the battle section when the ship separated, but after separation, the battle bridge would be in the exact same position right on the top of the battle section in an exposed situation. And they never really learned from this design flaw either, since when they built the Enterprise E, they put the bridge in the exact same position, and this happened. Luckily, Picard and Troy were protected by plot armor, but those junior officers could have really done with seatbelts to keep them in their chairs. And that brings us to our next point about the bridge. Number two, regardless of its position, the bridge is a really dangerous place to be. So like we mentioned, there are no seatbelts, so when the inertial dampers fail to keep the ship stable, you'll be tossed out of your seat and probably smash your head on the floor. And not even the main characters can escape the carnage. You'd think they'd install some kind of safety mechanism, even my car has airbags. And on top of that, the control panels on the bridge are kind of like a ticking time bomb waiting to explode at the slightest incident. Klingon disruptor fire hits somewhere else several hundred meters away on the hull of the ship, and this happens on the bridge. Number three, their security sucks. The Enterprise is constantly getting stolen, hijacked, and infiltrated. There's one time it is stolen from inside a starbase by a race that communicates using binary code and interfaces with the computer directly. Another time the ship is infiltrated by thieves during a routine maintenance stop. During a ship-wide evacuation, alien thieves target the Enterprise. Stay right where you are. And the crew is taken hostage in a brutal assault. <laughs> And then there's the one time when the Ferengi hijack the ship and a bunch of kids manage to do what the adult security personnel can't and retake the ship. Number four, the saucer section can't land in a controlled way. Since the Enterprise can separate into two sections, the saucer section can serve as an escape vessel in the event of a warp core breach in the battle section. This exact scenario happens in the movie Star Trek Generations and the saucer is forced to land on a planet. The producers of this movie consulted the Star Trek technical manual. On page 29, there is a diagram on how the saucer section is supposed to crash land on the surface of a planet. It is an incredibly destructive process that writes off the entire ship and will no doubt raise the captain's insurance premium for years to come. My question is, why didn't they just give the Enterprise saucer section landing gear? We know that about 100 years before the Enterprise of the next generation, Starfleet already had relatively large ships that could fly stably within an atmosphere. Take the USS Shenzhou, for example, which can be seen stabilizing itself within an atmosphere using RCS thrusters, a system that could probably function even if main power to the impulse engines was down. The saucer section could then land just like the USS Voyager does. Sorry, wrong clip. There we go. Landing gear avoids millions of Federation credits worth of damage. 
And another fault with the movie here, why didn't the crew just eject using the escape pods located all over the surface of the saucer section before it crash landed on the planet? Each escape pod can seat up to six people and has its own power supply and life support and ejects from the hull of the ship at a speed of 40 meters per second. And it can then conduct its own planetary landing in a controlled way. This is more of a flaw with the movie rather than with the design of the ship itself. Number five, the ship's shield frequency doesn't modulate automatically. Going back to the movie Generations, the design flaw that allows the Klingons to destroy the battle section in the first place is the fact that they hide a secret camera inside Geordi's visor, security issues there, and view the Enterprise's shield modulation frequency on a control panel in engineering. And it seems that if you match a torpedo frequency to a shield frequency, you can penetrate the ship's shields. So my question is, why don't they just modulate the different frequencies automatically? At this time, the Enterprise had already engaged the Borg and already learned the trick of modulating their shield frequency to break free of Borg tractor beams. So why don't they just make this a security update and keep modulating the shields on random frequencies to avoid this kind of cheap trick by the Duras sisters who quite frankly are known better for their display of cleavage than their ability at winning battles. Our shields are down! Fire. Number six, a torpedo launcher that points inward at the ship. The saucer section of the Enterprise is equipped with an aft-facing torpedo launcher for use when in separated flight mode and being pursued by an enemy ship. But crazily, this torpedo launcher, when the ship is joined, actually faces inward towards the battle section. You can clearly see it on the Enterprise blueprints pointing inward towards the battle section with 70 photon torpedoes sitting next to it. What happens when they run out of torpedoes in the regular launchers? Do those torpedoes just sit there? What a stupid design. Not only does it render the torpedo launcher and its 70 torpedoes useless 99% of the time, but it provides a way for terrorists, the Ferengi, the Borg, Klingon sisters with nice jugs to blow the ship in half by simply employing a spy to get on the Enterprise and launch a torpedo inwardly at the ship. If they just moved this torpedo launcher a few decks higher, it would still serve the same purpose as a defensive weapon in separated flight mode, but it would add an extra aft torpedo launcher in regular flight mode, add 70 photon torpedoes to the usable arsenal, and also be one less way the ship could get destroyed. Number seven, the warp engines are in a very exposed position. What other vehicle puts its engine on a pylon that sticks out for other ships to shoot at? If you look at some other Starfleet vessels, many of them keep their engines in a more protected position behind the hull so they can't be shot at from all angles. Yet the Enterprise, like with the bridge position, offers a very easy target. Number eight, an inefficient use of space. The Enterprise D is very luxurious. We know from designs of similar types of vessels on Earth, cruise ships, military vessels, for example, that designers try to keep the overall mass down and use the space wisely for increased efficiency. But the Enterprise doesn't do this, however. Her wide corridors, large, luxurious bridge, and expansive holodecks don't even try to conserve space. What is more, according to the Star Trek Next Generation Technical Manual, 35% of the volume of the ship is not even used, providing space for future upgrades. So the Enterprise is actually lugging around 35% more volume than she actually needs. To be honest, the Borg have it right with their cube and sphere shaped ships. And you see this with real UFOs that have been sighted, which are often saucer, cigar, or egg shaped, keeping everything within a simple hull design with a small surface area. Number nine, multi-role capability equals inefficiency. Starfleet doesn't build battleships, at least not at the time of the next generation TV show. It just fits out its exploration vessels with advanced weaponry and hopes for the best. So you have an exploration vessel with families and kids on board and 35% extra unused volume for it to lug around, facing off against super advanced dedicated warships like the Romulan Warbird the Klingon bird of prey, and the Cardassian warship. 
even the Borg had dedicated tactical cubes that you see in the Voyager series. This is a flaw that was corrected with the Sovereign class Enterprise E, which is sleeker, more maneuverable, has no science labs, no families on board, and no unused space. Number 10, there was only one toilet. Nah, <laughs> that's actually a joke, but number 10 is a fun one. Number 10, there was no physical joystick for maneuvering the ship. It has always been a mystery to me how the crew of the Enterprise could pull off fast-paced maneuvers in battle by using a touchscreen interface alone. Do they first of all work out the angle and heading they want to fly at and then just enter the numbers? Because that would take ages. Or do they randomly keep pressing directional buttons like someone playing a PlayStation game? In the terrible movie Star Trek Insurrection, on the Enterprise E, we do finally get to see a joystick in the form of the manual steering column. Transfer helm controls to manual. Bridge. Which is more like a penis extension for Jonathan Frakes, who directed the movie himself and had his own character, Commander Riker, pull off the so-called Riker maneuver using the manual penis column. I mean, manual steering column. To be honest, it could be something much cooler. Why would a 24th century steering system look exactly the same as a joystick used for a 20th century computer game? They could have done something like the full body control system used by Jaeger pilots in Pacific Rim, and it would have been a lot cooler. All right, guys, those are my 10 design flaws of the Enterprise D. Let me know if you agree or if there are any others that I missed in the comments below. And also let me know which Star Trek ship we should do next. Thanks for watching, guys. Please subscribe if you are new. Give this video a like. And if you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.